Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this episode, what I want to do is look at a very interesting new paper that combines kind of two very well-known practice design effects. So two things we know that can help an, a new learner acquire a skill. And they are the, the effects of variability of practice, the classic effect, and the effects of errorless versus errorful learning. So we want to look at the, this paper is going to combine these two things. Before we get to that, let's look at kind of the basics, right? Um, so this is the paper, right? Um, thank you to the authors for sending a recently published in Journal of Motor Behavior. Thank you very much to the authors for sending me a copy. So um, in this paper, right, we're going to look at the, the effects of variability of practice. And this is something I talk, I've talked about a lot on the podcast. I have this page that I've devoted because there's a lot of confusions in this, in this area. So basically what we're talking about here is the classic effect of training with blocked practice, where you repeat the same conditions over and over, versus random practice, where you, um, where you mix up the conditions, right? Um, a couple of misconceptions that are common in this is the difference between a block versus random, the between skill variation, and constant versus variable. Um, the, you know, the basic effect that we're talking about is you know, this classic effect that with random practice, when you're switching between conditions, you learn, you acquire the skill more slowly, but in the long term, in retention tests and transfer tests, you're, you're better with random practice versus block practice. And this has been a typically explained by contextual interference, the idea that switching between different conditions interferes with the development of the motor program. And in the end, it, it develops more slowly, but it makes it more robust, more elaborate, more resistant to forgetting, things like that. As I've pointed out, there's also, you can explain the same effects by um, in the ecological approach, right? Variability of practice provokes movement degeneracy. Uh, you know, all the benefits of variability have talked about forever, stochastic resonance and differential learning and so, so on and so forth. This leads me to one of the pet peeves I have of this area that is present in this paper. You know, the authors are not doing this themselves. They're just kind of perpetuating this, this uh, terminology that I don't really like. What I'm talking about here is when people talk about the benefits of random practice over blocked practice, they very commonly call that the CI or the contextual interference effect. That is not the effect. We're not trying to explain contextual interference. That is a theoretical interpretation. What we're trying to explain is the variability of practice effect. The fact that you perform better, you learn better under random conditions than block conditions. That's the effect. Contextual interference is an explanation for that effect, right? So these two often get confounded together. Contextual interference is not the effect, right? Variability of practice is the effect. So contextual interference, you're imposing a theoretical explanation on it. So please, I implore people, stop using this term, right? The CI effect. It's not, that's not the effect. The effect is variability of practice. The CI is an explanation, you know, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it, it's not the effect we're trying to explain. So that's one of my pet peeves I keep. And if you go on that page, the, the perceptionaction.com forward slash VP, I go through all the terminology in this point in elaborate detail. I think it's a really important, important one to make. But anyways, that's one uh, uh, thing the study is looking at, the benefits of variability of practice. The other thing they're looking at is something I talked way back about 400 episodes ago, way back in episode 16, is the benefits of errorless learning, right? And this is a work of rich masters associated with implicit learning, right? So errorless learning, it, I've illustrated this for here in, in golf putting. In errorless learning conditions, what we do is we start, for example, from learning the golf putt, we start very close to the hole, and then we move outwards as we continue to practice. The idea here is that if you start really close to the hole, say half a foot, you're not gonna make many errors, right? You're gonna make lots of putts. And then as we move out to like 10 feet from the hole, you've already had lots of practice. So you're likely to make more 10 foot putts. So errorless learning is starting close and then moving far away. So to reduce the number of errors you make. Errorful learning is when you start far away and then move close. Notice here, right? They're in the end, they're doing the exact same set of putts. It's just the order, right? And Rich Masters has shown in his work in a few studies that when you do errorless learning, 
Um, you get better retention. You're better under pressure. Well, this was the secondary task study. In, it, it was, and then you're better in novel conditions, putting from a distance you never put in. And he's, his explanation for why this errorless learning is beneficial, beneficial is in terms of implicit learning. When you don't make errors, you don't start, you don't do a explicit hypothesis testing. Oh, I left that too short. I need to make my swing a bit, backswing a bit longer, right? That's explicit hypothesis testing, uh, thinking about how you control your movements, right? Um, that errors promote that, right? Whereas if you're not making errors, you don't do that. And you, you learning is more implicit. That's his idea, right? So this paper wanted kind of to combine these effects and they point out kind of uh, important contradiction, right? If we accept these traditional explanations for the variability of practice effect, um, like contextual interference, <clears throat> um, for example, two of the most dominant explanations that have been put forth is random uh, practice is better because it makes you elaborate your, your motor program for different conditions, the elaboration hypothesis. It is also better because it makes you break it down, it have to break it down and reconstruct it during new, so it's going to make it more resilient in memory motor program. So both of these are arguing that the reason variability of practice is good is because it's placing more information cognitive demands on the athlete, right? They have to reconstruct, they have to elaborate. These are information processing demands. Whereas errorless learning seems to be the opposite, right? We're placing less hy explicit hypothesis testing demands on you by using the errorless learning condition, reducing the number of errors. And that's what makes you, making you skillful. So these two, two things seem to contradict each other. So what they wanted to do is in study this in, in, in a combined effect, right? So they want to look at the combined effects of random versus block practice. Um, you know, I'll get to that in a second. And errorless versus errorful practice on motor learning. And also they kind of introduced this, this new way of quantifying it, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. So what they're going to do, um, you know, they're going to have all possible combinations of errorful Er and errorless, right? So moving, errorful is starting far away where you're going to make lots of errors. Errorless is where you start close. Um, we could also have a random condition where you just do randomly close to far. And then they're going to have three types of variability, right? They're going to have random conditions, um, uh, serial conditions, and blocked conditions. So a little more detail here. I would personally call this, right? This is not a random versus block study. This is a constant versus variable practice, okay? For me, as I explained on that page, random versus blocked refers to switching between different skills for me, right? Chipping versus putting in golf, yeah? Uh, shooting, uh, you know, so this is all the same skill. It's the studies with dart throwing. It's just from different distances, right? That's constant. You're doing the same skill, but you're varying the parameters, the, the required, the distance. So that's constant versus variable. But, but whatever, I'll, I'll make that point here and I'll drop it for the rest. So blocked practice is when you do a whole bunch of uh, throws from um, a certain distance, then you switch to another one, then you switch to another one. Uh, random practice is when you alternate between different distances. And serial practice is when you uh, alter, you, do, uh, you mix the distances, but in kind of a progressive way. And I'll talk more about the specific conditions when we get to it in a second. Okay. So what they're doing, this is kind of, so this paper is framed within an information processing approach. So they predict random practice will promote greater learning compared to block practice due to increased processing requirements, the elaboration, the forgetting. We also predict that errorless practice will promote greater levels of automati autom automation, automaticity, and, and greater, uh, performance under secondary task demands because of reduced requirements of processing, in this case, processing errors. So in the introduction, they're trying to fit these two things together by the fact that you're processing different things, right? Variability of practice, random versus blocked, is making you process the information for the task. Errorless for errorful, errorful is making you process your errors after the, the skill is execution is completed. So they're trying to argue that you can fit these two things together because you're processing different things. One one thing you want to promote, you want to process more. One you want to process less, which you know for me is a bit convoluted. But but you'll see the results don't really support this idea anyway. Okay. So what they're going to do, as I mentioned, they're doing a dart throwing task. They have 120 complete novices to dart throwing. They're going to split into eight different training groups, eight per group. 
They're going to do a pre and post test where they do 10 throws from kind of an intermediate distance. Then then they're going to train for, they did train for three days, 70 trials for training per day. We'll talk about the different groups in a second. Then they did the post test and they also did two transfer tests. So the transfer test was a secondary task essentially designed to see how uh, well this, uh, you know, to the classic test for automation, uh, automaticity that I've done tons and published my, in studies I've done. So what they had to do is while they were throwing dart, throwing the dart, there was sounds playing over the loudspeaker in the gym. There was mixed sounds, right? There were different types and they had to count a certain type. So they had to listen while they were doing a second secondary task while they were throwing the dart. Um, so they had eight total training groups that represent all possible combinations of random versus ran, the variability of practice and errorful learning. So Completely random practice would be just throwing darts from a different distance, randomly chosen every time. Random errorless is there's a little bit of variation, randomness in where you throw from, but you start all from relatively close. So there's they're picking a bunch of close distances and varying it within that. Then you move to far distances and vary within that. Error full would be starting with randomly chosen far distance and then moving to randomly chosen close distances. Serial would be kind of a more of a progression. Um, then we have serial errorful progression in the other direction. Uh, blocked, uh, do all the executions of the, the close distance, then move to the farther one. Um, blocked errorful, do all the far ones, then move to the close ones without any randomization. And then constant practice was practicing from the same distance the, the, throughout practice, the, the intermediate distance that you're going to have to throw from uh, in the end. Okay, so those are the eight training groups. So, so well designed. I think it's really a nicely designed study. I really applaud the authors for trying to combine these things and get into some of the subtleties of these effects. Instead of, you know, I always talk about this in, in, in what, I'm, what I'd like to see in research. Instead of doing another study that shows block, random is better than blocked for this skill, let's get into some of the subtleties of what's going on here. And I think the study is doing that in a nice way. So what did they find, right? So they had all these different conditions, different testing periods. What they measured, you know, you were throwing to the, uh, essentially the bullseye, equivalent of a bullseye. They measured how far away the dart was from the bullseye. So radial error, and that, that was used as a term, okay? So here's what they found. So interestingly, what they found, there's this, they found this really strong interaction, right? So. If you looked at the errorless conditions, so all the conditions where you're starting close in some way and moving out, what you found is you get the classic variability of practice effect, right? Um, the, re the acquisition of the skill in terms of reduction in errors is a bit slower than for the, the random condition than the, either the blocked or the serial. But when you go to retention, the performance is much, much better, lower errors, in the ran for the group that was trained under the random conditions as composed to either the serial or the uh, blocked, right? So the group that was, think about this. So the group that started close to the dartboard and had, but had some very slight variation in the distance was much better than the group that started close to the dartboard and threw from the same, same distance every time lot in the block. Okay. And both of those, and, and they were all the group that started close and, and had some random variation was also better than the group that started far and had some variation. Right. So we seem to get the classic variability of practice effect under errorless conditions. Right. Right. So you under errorless conditions, you're getting better, um, uh, getting better for random conditions than blocked conditions in the retention. Interestingly, when you looked at the error full group, the group that started far away and moved close, you got a, a complete reversal of the effect, right? So the group that was random and errorful, right? So you're starting far from the dartboard and you have some variation in the distance, did the worst in the retention, right? Instead of the benefits of random practice, they showed a clear uh, problem with random practice that hurt their performance. The groups that did blocked errorful started far away, but always did this, did the same repeats, um, did better as the, well as the serial group. So interesting interaction between the two things, and we'll talk about why in a second, right? So that was the main effect. Um, in terms of transfer, when you're transferring to the secondary task condition, um, what they found is the random errorless group 
the group that started close with some variability. Had, so it could basically combining the benefits from the two previous lines of research showed the lowest errors in both transfer tests as compared to the other the other groups. Okay, so they're they're showing these classic effects, but they're showing this inter interesting interaction between them. So why? <coughs> so the 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 basically the authors, you know, as I said, they tried to frame a lot of these effects in the, the information processing theories. They argue that there, there was no way, one theory that could really account for all this, whether it was challenge point or elaboration or, you know, um, contextual interference, or whatever. Um, they just, they, they said that the main finding from the study was that optimal learning condition requires a complex balance between task difficulty, individual skill level, contextual interference and error processing, right? So there's this complex interaction going on. The main finding, of course, was that errorless practice should be combined with conditions that create more variability, random practice for greatest effectiveness, right? So that's what they're showing. They did, if you want to go back and read this paper in, in the, the results section and some of the discussion section, they do attempt to reconcile some of these effects. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the idea that, um, that uh, too much effort from random practice and, and processing errors overwhelms working memory, things like that. I don't really want to go into to that in detail because obviously I don't ascribe to that, those kind of interpretations, but you can read them in the paper if you like. Here's my, so here's my basic interpretation. So remember, random practice was good under errorless conditions, but not good under errorful, right? That was the main kind of finding um, in both in terms of retention and transfer, right? So what is this going on? Here's my interpretation. Of course, I want to interpret this in terms of constraints and self-organization. So when you move, when you're further away from a dartboard as compared to being very close, what you do is you've created constraints that place much higher demands on the required movement solution, right? When I'm farther away from dart, the dartboard, a little misalignment with the bullseye is going to exaggerate it, right? The, it's going to lead the dart being way further away from the bullseye in the end as comp if, if I'm misaligned and I'm one inch away, right? It's not gonna produce a big error. The other big thing that moving further away creates, right? is it creates a problem of dealing with gravity, right? I, if I'm far away from a dartboard, I, I now I have to take into account both the angle of release and the speed of release, like a basketball shot, right? I have to come up with a combination of that that's gonna get to the dart to the right point. So the basic idea is that further away, the constraints are much more demanding, right? And moving, starting from further away, and this is particularly gonna be the case if you've never thrown a dart before, if you've never thrown, you know, played darts before, and we start you from far away, that's a huge amount of constraints, right? You're bringing your own variability, and, and you really have to. The, the, the constraints on the successful movement solution are super high. The same is true when we make you switch, right? As opposed to when you're throwing the dart from the same distance every time. If I make you switch distances. Not only now do you have to have a nice movement solution, you have to reparameterize it and recalibrate it each time as you switch distance. So again, switching distances, i.e. in the random condition, imposes more demanding constraints on the performer, right? Um, so if I combine errorful conditions starting from far away and random, random conditions switching between distances, what I've done for a complete novice is created constraints that are way too demanding, right? For a complete novice. Um, they're bringing, they're already very variable. They've never done this themselves. I'm creating, overwhelming them with chaos and conditions. What that's gonna lead is a very ineffective search for a movement solution, right? There's too many demands on them. It's challenge, if you wanna think of a challenge, challenge is too high, right? And this is something we talk about all the time, right? Variability is good and important for developing skill, but it has to be scaled appropriately, right? This is an example where we need to scale down the dart throwing task, right? We can't start you super far away. We need to scale it down by moving you closer. So you get some basic uh, proficiency. You find a basic coordination solution that gets the dart to the board. Then you can move away and figure out how to parameterize that, control that solution, um, optimize it for different distances and so on, right? So 
for me, the reason you don't get the classic benefit of random practice is adding starting at a far distance is just too much, right? It's too many, too much going on for a new complete novice, right? There's too much going on. If instead I take random practice, we know the benefits of that, and I combine it with error less, so I start you closer where the constraints are less, then that's more the sweet spot, right? So there's a sweet spot for variability in practice, right? We don't want it too low, right? Um, in, in, the, in the constraints and the condition, we don't want them too low so that you, where you're doing strict repetition, because that doesn't occur in de developed adaptation and all the other degeneracy and all the other things we want. But we can't have it too high either where it's complaint chaos. So for me, you can explain all these effects simply by looking at the constraints imposed on the learner, how that's going to shape the search, how that's going to get them to pick up information about the distance and things like that, rather than imposing all these underlying processes like implicit learning, working memory, uh, hypothesis testing, and, and so on. I think you can do it in much more simple explanation. But anyways, I, I, again, I thank the authors for sending me the paper. I think it's a really interesting study, really well executed. Um, and I think, you know, I think uh, we need more of these, like I've said, and in getting into the subtleties of some of these things. So that's it for today's episode. Thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.